a place called the Bavarian Room. It was like a family restaurant, and then after nine, it was a women's bar. Mm -hmm. And that happened. Uh, where was that? On Garden Grove Boulevard. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was incredible, the, 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 the cluster of clubs there. Really? Mm -hmm. It was, you know, and we played at this place called the D.O.K. West, which was the first drag queen bar I'd ever been in. Now everybody knows mm -hmm. about Finocchio's in San Francisco and every straight, you know, American faith. 50s father and mom, uh, mom and dad would go to the female impersonators. Yeah. Well, this yeah. was a little different. And we were the only band that ever played there because mm -hmm. the hostess at the happy hour, her name was Miss Candy, she was a drag queen or transgender, um, liked us, well, she liked me. And she got us a job, and it was amazing because it was just a guy on stage lip syncing, and people just putting hundreds of dollars and one dollars and five dollar bills anywhere they could put them, <laughs> and lip syncing. And I was just like, wow, this is. I, I, like I said, I feel like Liza Minnelli in cabaret sometimes. Mm -hmm. so. And I wasn't completely. Oh, this is the list. Though. Yeah, I wasn't I completely I was sheltered that. because a lot of my friends came out in '72 because of Alice Cooper and David Bowie, and so I had a lot of gay friends. So yeah, the Happy Hour. You can see it listed on the third column, right under D.O.K. West at the top, and there's the Happy Hour there. At one two oh eight one Garden Grove Boulevard, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. we played the. The Naughty Kids and uh, the Sound Club and uh, a lot of places, too, but they did want disco music, but the woman around the happy hour, she was like, anything we did, she, she yeah, liked they're, they're all on Garden Grove Boulevard, they like over there. Sorry. Oh. Was it a hamper alert? Yeah, I was going to say, is yeah. it this they drop in the bomb? Or and this is the same, this is the same Silver Yeah, yeah, this is an yeah. example of the listings that would have been in some place like this and people would know where they could go and, go and be safe and not be hassled because, you know, you, you would not see somebody back in 75 walking down the street dressed in drag with pink with pink hair. It would be murder. Put it on vibrate. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know what to do with it. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, this is also another page in there. Another page in there, that which was very interesting because this is hmm. the first time I read about punk rock and CBGBs in New York. Hmm. And they were talking about how all of a sudden these people were dressing in this butch kind of biker style. It was so new. Well, what was also interesting, our drummer at the time was a guy named Jeff Ivisevich. And he'd been talking about, I would get on stage and shave all my hair off. And, and, you know, black out my teeth and act like I've been in a fight and put blood on myself. And this was a year and a half before Hug Rock. Well, he read this article too, and a year later he went up to Hollywood and he formed the Weirdos. Huh. Oh, wow. And he ended up being in the LA Guns. And he played with the Cramps. Hmm. And Venus and the Razor Blades. And uh, so I. You so know, when we were talking about this, I didn't realize it was the same Vicky Alexander that was in the LA Guns. Yeah, he calls himself Nikki B and Nikki Alexander, and he says they're two brothers that never talk to each other, so they're two different guys, but it's really him. <laughs> okay. And I confirmed that because I took a deep breath, I hadn't talked to him for 40 years, and I called, I con contacted him on Facebook, and then I talked to him over the phone, and he told me about his, his, his life, but he was a very eccentric guy, and he talked very quickly, and the phone reception was pretty rotten. But, <laughs> He's uh, now retired from music. He lives out in uh, near Victorville. He's got emphysema. He's quite sick. Mm -hmm. I hope I can get the book done before he dies. But he's told me I can use his name in there. So I, I might do that. It'll add a certain cachet to the, mm -hmm. to the proceedings because the guy that played drums before I joined this group, I, see, I met this woman keyboard player. I put a note at Wallach's Music City and said, I need a gig. Mm -hmm. So this woman called me. And said, uh, first she said, how old are you, and are you gay and straight, and all this. And I met her, and we got along. Well, the drummer had, who had played with her before was a guy named Art Wood. Well, he ended up playing with Gary Wright, the guy who did Dreamweaver, and he was a drummer on Star Search for 13 years. And now he has a recording studio, and he's, a, you know, got invited to Bette Midler's wedding. I mean, he's a real, you know, industry guy. So out of this little club came all this, these, this energy. Just, and then the, the drummer after Jeff was a boyfriend of mine from high school, this big tall guy, he's about 68, 
and he's a noise band guy. He's in all the noise bands like, um, oh, I don't know the name of them all, but he's part of that scene. Have you told him the name of your band? Do we know what band we're talking about yet? The band we were called Half Moon. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where you played all these places, so it's Half Moon. Half Moon. And so the happy hour I did an hour, a year and a half every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Friday and Saturday was 9.30 till 1.30, and Sunday was 6 till 10.30, 11. And after about a year and a half, it really started to get to me, but you'll read all about it, because when you play in bars like that, you do do drugs. You do them to sleep, and you do them to wake up. And it'll catch up with you. I can guarantee it. But before you get to that, the book actually starts with you in school. Me in school, yeah. What, so what year does the book start? Okay, about 1974, I was a printmaking major. I was about 18 credits short of a degree. I'd done four years of Harvard Junior College in Wilmington as an art major, and then I went to Long Beach, and I hated it. The parking was horrible. Nobody hung out. Now, Roberta Gregory, she was over here in the illustration department across the courtyard, <laughs> and Phil Ye was going there. If I knew them, them, I probably would Oh. I would have graduated, but I was just so lonely. I had nothing to say. Couldn't meet a boyfriend. You know, art, art major guys, they don't know they're going to sleep with you or have you critique their final. I mean, they're really like, <laughs> So that's me sitting there having my little cigarette and thinking about what I'm going to do next. And I'm showing this because I want to show you what it looks like before cross hatching and then after. Mm -hmm. And it just adds just so much to a. And you would think it's subtle, but when you when you really look at the difference, I mean that is that's yeah. pretty startling. It adds a third color. Yeah. yeah. But you can do it back and forth and make a little animation out of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could do it. Yeah. yeah. So, Roberta, is this what it looked like? Oh, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the seventies. You can draw it your way. <laughs> anyway, I. Um, <laughs> After having a couple of horrible dates and not being able to think to draw anything and after catching my printmaking teacher in the hallway, one of the TAs doing you know what, I just go, I don't belong here. Plus I took a class called Masters uh, Issues in Art and that's what this page is about. The teacher was saying, why are you here? What are you doing? What do you want to do? Are you here because your parents told you to come? And I'm going, I don't know. And he and and I thought about that for uh, I thought about that question for thirty years. Why was I there? What the hell was I doing? And I didn't know. In fact, at one point, I switched my major to microbiology because I found out you could get twelve hundred dollars a month working in a lab. But there was only one problem: I can't do math. So when I got my first chemistry test back, the teacher goes, well, Mary, I gave you a D plus because you spelled your name right. And I go, it's an old one, Mr. Lee. And he goes, okay, an F it is. <laughs> so my printmaking teacher grabbed me one day and he goes, what are you doing? Where were you last semester? And I go, well, I don't have any money. He goes, come on. So he grabbed me back to the office and he, he changed back to art major. So I kind of looked up to the guy. But then catching him in the hallway, Mary. So anyway, um, so this is how I do my pencils. I do them very lightly, and then before I would draw them, I tighten it as I go along because I, I don't want to draw the same thing twice. So this is uh, the teacher, you know, challenging us to think about what we're doing. So I used to take my Zap comics to the printmaking studio and show them to people. And I got so much crap from my teacher, like he says, oh, Mary, is that one of those X-rated sap comics? And mm. I go, come on, Roger. And he's going, no, it's nothing but masturbatory, you know, fantasies of some hippie. And, and I'm like, oh, no, yeah, and you've got underage, you know, pictures of Asian girls in your office. Give me a break, oh. okay? And he's like, oh, no, those represent the goddess, not the temptress. Oh. Oh. Well, bad hands, uh, Roger. I see my, uh, on the surface, these are uh, provocative, yet they define the significance of sociological ages of the cultural phenomena. You know, so we always have these little sparring you know, verbal things. There's a lot of crap to the underground. And, and uh, so the comics were just like a big nothing burger when I went to college. But that's what I really wanted to do. I wanted to be an underground cartoonist. But 
best you could do is an illustration major. And she's like, illustration major? Yeah, it's like theater or something. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, the, that was the main thing that I thought about. And then after I dropped out of college and I threw away my art supplies and said to people, I don't do art, I'm not an artist, I'm a musician. And I got a job at Marshall Music in Torrance and got a, a bass and an amp and I started practicing real hard. And five years later, the muse and I, we made up, and I started drawing again, and here's the drawing I did in 1979. I was at a party, and I was just doodling around, and all of a sudden I go, gosh, I can draw again. But what was happening as a printmaker, I was wearing gloves, I was doing all-nighters, I was putting my hands right in the nitric acid, I was using acetone, benzene, turpentine, paint thitter. Smoke and cigarettes, <laughs> and I, it, it, it ruined my it ruined my chemistry, and then I couldn't draw. I couldn't focus. I had yeah, you probably health problems the, and carbon monoxide poisoning a little bit. Well, from the cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is the last image that you have, but I do want to talk a little bit about. Oh, it is. This big, yeah, that's. Oh, we're going right in a fast clip here. But I do want to talk a little bit about the period in between leaving, deciding that you didn't want to be an artist and throwing away your art supplies and starting the, the band. How did you get hooked up with people that became your, your musician? Okay, well I'll preface it with, I always had a lot of my friends that played music and a lot of my friends were musicians in high school. And if they couldn't get a band, they usually hook up with some like bar band and they play in San Pedro or they play in Carson. And they weren't very good. And I was going, well, gosh, you don't have to be really good to play in a bar, I guess. And they were getting paid every weekend. And it was, you know, the, the, the kids I knew were good enough musicians, but the guy that they would hook up with being sort of really bad, like this one guy, um, his name was Tarmu. And he was Polynesian. He would play down in San Pedro, but he couldn't speak English very well, so he'd be doing, you know, I can see clearly now the see Hey, this guy. You can see all obstacles in my way. And, and <laughs> people in bars, you have your drink, they don't listen to the music. And so, um, a boyfriend of mine, he found me a Mustang bass that was probably stolen. And so I started practicing with that before I dropped out of college. I already had the guitar and a little uh, amp, the studio mm -hmm. with me. And um, so my interest was already fading away. But I knew that when you learn an instrument, it takes three to five years. So I was willing to, you know, do the wood shedding. And I was in for a long haul. Um, when I walked out of class, never to return. I had a friend who was working at Marshall Music, so he said they needed a bookkeeper. I said, you got it. And then it was, uh, before I joined a band playing bass, I was in bands where I just... A bookkeeper? You said you couldn't do math. Well, I was a bookkeeper. I was, I was a bill keeper. Oh, okay. I, was, I was sending out the bills and sending people late notices and typing. Okay, okay, okay. you're right. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> so anyway, in one band I was in right away because I worked at a music store, was just singing harmony and banging a tambourine. But that was okay, I was in a band, and I was getting 30 bucks a night, I didn't care. We played the Del Mar uh, Mall, they had a, like a, a barrier around in the middle of the mall, so I are on stage and the animals are going around like this, so it was kind of fun. And then I met some um, friends that I know at Harvard College, and so I just joined some band where all they played was Chuck Berry stuff. <laughs> That gave me a really good foundation about how to do a 12-bar blues and, and basic rock and roll. And then, uh, you know, jam with this guy and that guy. But the guys I went to high school, they wouldn't play with it. Kind of like I have Trina's story in a way. Yeah. So when I did put that sign up at Walt's Music City and I met Janet Pearson, that was a keyboard player, she'd already been playing with a singer named Steve. And I can't find any of them on the internet. I, don't, I, I assume they might have died, you know, because of AIDS or maybe hepatitis or something. Um, there's one thing on YouTube of this woman singing the song that Cheech Martin wrote called Does Your Mama Know About Me? Mm -hmm. And she was a really good singer. She was like across between Bette Midler and Cher. I mean, she was really good. And she, it's like that Billy Joel song, man, what are you doing here? Yeah. Why was she singing in these shitty little bars, you know? Yeah. 
but that's she was a lesbian, and where else would you know where could else she get hired because of the prejudice? Mm -hmm. You know, a couple of times I'd be on stage, the cops down there would come into the bar in full riot gear, right. hands on the holsters, wow. just like stuck rubber baby, and everybody would have to separate. And if you're dancing with somebody, you'd separate, and they'd walk up and down the aisle. Wow. Hmm. The looks of hate in their eye, they didn't know I was gay or straight, they didn't care. Mm -hmm. So it was, it yeah. was hairy. So um, Janet and I... Do you guys know what Stuck Rubber Baby is, what, mm -hmm. what she's referring to? Well, I'll tell you, Howard Cruz, who recently passed, did this book he worked on for four years, and it's about a, a young man growing up in the South who's trying to be straight. He has a crush on a folk singer named Ginger, and they, uh, uh, they do like each other. And then the night they decide to finally consummate their, their crush, he whips out a rubber that he's had in his wallet because you hold that, you know, show that to the guys, you go, yeah, I got a rubber here, and they go, yeah, yeah. Well, the problem was it had been in his wallet for like seven years, so when he took it out, it, it was all stuck together, so that's why it's called stuck rubber baby. But he does impregnate her in the book, and she has to give the baby up for adoption, so it covers gay issues, the civil rights, um, somebody gets lynched, I mean, it's a heavy book. But it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's a seminal graphic novel by Howard Cruz. And he's inspired me. Uh, that book inspired me. I think about him now often while I'm doing this. Hope nobody thinks I copied him or anything. But he writes about at a time where they're in a gay bar and a red light would go on. That meant the cops are outside. Better pretend you're straight. And so uh, he'd be standing there, and all of a sudden this woman starts dancing with him. He goes, "No, so we got to do, honey, because we're gonna need you." And um, you know, it was it was here. Uh, people warned me: do not take any side streets to go to the freeway when the bar closes, because the cops will pull you over and they'll charge you with a DUI or expect a sexual favor. And that happened all the time. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of how I met Janet. And then they needed a drummer, and I'd already been hanging around with Jeff, Nicky. So I said, well, and he was a good drummer. But he was so funny, he used to come to the gigs wearing women's tube tops and pink rubber uh, dishwashing gloves. <laughs> so he was always like an oddball. But he was straight at it. He didn't smoke, he didn't drink. I never saw him do anything. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. when I used to get his phone call, he'd go, Oh, you're getting stupid now, hippie. <laughs> so he was like born a punk rocker. It was really funny. And now you've reconciled playing music and art doing both and both sides now and you've even picked up from you're doing uh, this is what I love about you you're always pushing going one step beyond one step further I'm learning new and things. Like, yeah because you've been a bass player for years yeah I started just in the last what two years you've picked up drums yeah, yeah. Um, I started playing guitar when I was 14 because I wanted to be in a group and if I wanted to be in the group I would play something so I said okay but then we moved from Canada to uh, Inglewood, so um, I was kind of on my own, and my brother gave me his guitar because he wasn't very talented. And so I got this beautiful Yamaha, and I started practicing real hard. And then when I was 24, I decided I want to be in a rock band. So that's when I got my bass and started you know, practicing real hard. And when I met my husband, we got married in 79, he was a musician, so we formed a band called Point to Point, and we used to play at, uh, under the pier, and this was a club that was open before the mask, and they'd have 99 cent night, and you could come there and see <laughs> X, the dogs, the last, the weirdos, even two guys from Cheap Trick came down right before Budokan was recorded because they wanted to check out the scene so they could play their Cheap Trick. Mm -hmm. So we met the drummer and the guitar player and then off they went to Japan and it was you know, cool. And, uh, and then uh, we had um, our band, uh, the Wigbillies, and our drummer was a young guy that Paul worked with and we kind of mentored him on drums and he kind of had a knack for it but he had a problem like in the middle of a song he'd stop playing and you just can't do that. <laughs> in the middle of a rocking song, you, you know, come on now. So he um, divorced and his kids uh, grew up. He, they, once they got over 21, he and his girlfriend moved to Oregon. 
So he gave me his drum kit. I got a little Ringo kit, sparkly glue, it's a Ludwig. I mean, it's a really nice wow. little kit. It was two cymbals, and so I just started, once again, practicing real hard, and there's lessons on YouTube, and I would practice every day, and I still, nothing makes me happier than go out in the garage. We have our garage, is a little jam cave. We have all our stuff out there now. And I just turn on iTunes, uh, tune in radio, and I'll either try uh, Grateful Dead, I'm not a Grateful Dead fan, but they jam. And I learned how to do jamming because I was really into jazz in high school. And, uh, so uh, and you've, 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 I can always hold my own in the jam. I can always hold my own now. And you, but you've played with the Wig Bills, <coughs> Wig Titans, and what's the name? Well, first we were the Wig Titans, and we were kind of a cross between Doctor Feelgood and, and Rock Pop. So we hmm. we were rockers, and then we fired the guitar player. <laughs> He was an old friend too, but he was he turned into a control freak. And I don't know what happens in bands, you know. These guys become the leader and they can't handle the power or something. And then we thought we wanted to go a more acoustic direction because I played dulcimer, but I have a pickup of my dulcimer, so I'm not to play with a feather or anything. I play rock and roll dulcimer. So I thought it'd be funny if we called the wig billies because that was more you know country sound. Yeah. And so uh, so now we're uh, playing with a young guy that we met at a little store in town. His name is Javier. He's 21 years old. He's Hispanic. And he's into Peter Green, early Fleetwood Mac. So we've been doing uh, songs with him. We just learned Albatross. I, could, I bought some ballads. That was cool. <laughs> boop, 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 boop. And um, he knows how to improvise. He knows how to jazz, do jazz stuff. So we're doing... Uh, John Coltrane stuff and Thelonious hmm. Monk and, and, wow. and he's written some instrumentals and but he's 21 and it, that astounds me. But I was into jazz, you know, I was into Miles Davis when I was 18. So anyway, we've got 10 minutes and do yeah, we, well, we real questions? real quick I, before we get into the questions, I want to say about this book. So you're just doing it and you'll deliver it when you're done. There's no time, there's no delivery, like I need a date to no, thank, publish. No, because okay. that's what choked me for 10 years was that kind of pressure. And I think it's F. Scott Fitzgerald, right? Yeah. He said there's, uh, don't ever worry about finishing it. Just do it mm -hmm. every day yes. and have fun with it. And if you do that, one day it'll be done. Mm -hmm. yep. That's the way it works. And Gary knows me, and he's, uh, we get along really well. So he's uh, giving me, this, I think it's freedom. Yeah. Well, I know that you're meticulous about your research, and you are contacting people from your past to kind of see what their stories are, what their recollections are. Yeah, I'm kind of done with that. After are that. you? Yeah. Yeah. After that last phone call, it was kind of a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> and considering I was kicked out of the band, I don't think Janet would want to talk to me either. Oh, I was a mess. I was a well, before we open it up to questions, I do want to say one one thing. I want to thank um, Dr. Paul Tornambi. Oh, Dr. Tornambi, that, that 